What's cracking, big dogs? That's my Godfather uh, impression for you right there. Um, we got we got me and Noah in the house. Back to the OG bunk bed breakdowns crew because Nick is I don't know what Nick's doing, but he's not here. Uh, Noah looking like he's hot box in his room over there. Yeah, animals uh, not with me. Contrary to popular belief, <laughs> it's not a hot box room. Animals not here. He's still enjoying his his zero and nine record over there on E Town Get Downs. Um, so yeah, we're going to do a quick flip through the games because there honestly isn't that much to cover, but we want to talk a little bit about, uh, how to prep for the playoffs, uh, strategy, both for redraft dynasty, um, et cetera. And just look at a little bit of the schedules uh, as well, but we're going to go through the games real quick. Um, but before we get into the games, man, you know what time it is. Time to hit that intro. You're real smart now. You don't let me, you don't <laughs> give me the time of day to just cut you off. Yeah, I'm I'm prepared, new. I'm prepared now. I'm all about now. Now that I got that Market Watch Monday segment, I know all about leading in the intro, so I'm always prepared. <laughs> you learned how to I'm edit. I'm always prepared now. Learned how to edit. All right, let's flip through the games here. First game up on the slate: Washington versus New York Giants. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna do a stinkometer, and I mean, everyone everyone in this game fucking stinks except for one guy, and that's Terry McLaurin, Nick's Bay. Uh, I think the only the only person that that he would love more than Zendaya herself, uh, Terry McLaurin, aka Scary Terry, which is the shittiest nickname ever, aka McLaurin F1. He looked good, man. I mean, he broke one. He broke a huge run. I don't know if you saw the play, but. They toss it up in the defender. I don't know what the fuck the defender was trying yeah, to do. Yeah, I don't think Alex Smith should get credit for that touchdown. That was all <laughs> yeah. Terry McLaurin. And then at the end of the game, too, they were about to bring it to overtime or, like, march up the field. And he throws it into triple coverage. But he didn't just do that. He looked Terry down, pump fake, pump fake, still <laughs> threw it to him. Like, what are you doing, man? I don't know. He's he's a mess. He, like, talking of stinking, both quarterbacks have done this stanky leg at this point. Like, Kyle Allen is gone. I don't yeah, know why Alex Smith is still playing. If I was Dwayne Haskins – I would legit just retire at this point. Like, <laughs> quarterback situation in Washington is one of the worst we've ever seen. And on the other side of the ball, Daniel Jones also stinks. So this whole game is just like a complete mess. I don't trust anybody other than like Sterling Shepard, who is an extremely discounted version of Terry McLaurin, just because he sees eight to 10 targets a game, yep. turns it into like 37 yards, which is whatever. But like, I mean, if you get those type of targets on an offense, that's basically playing garbage time for 60 minutes, unless they're playing Washington. I'm fine rolling him out as a wide receiver three, and he's actually owned in less than 60% of the league. So go out there and get yourself a pretty stinky receiver on a terrible team. Yeah, definitely do that up. Next game up, more stinkage. Tennessee at Chicago Bears. Everyone on the Bears fucking stinks except for A-Rob, but he's st- attached to Nick Foles who fucking stinks. I mean, that entire offense, I mean, I had a back and forth on Twitter with someone who was trying to sell me on this David Montgomery strength of schedule, and I was like, Dude, I don't know. It's the same thing ever... with Jonathan Taylor. It's like, yeah, the strength <laughs> schedule is really good. If you put me on the Bears, I'd have a good strength <laughs> schedule too. I'm not going to get a damn yard out there. Dave yeah. Montgomery, six. six. So Thanks. bad. Uh, a Rob, I mean, this guy just, it's just pain. Just pain for A Rob. On the other side of the ball, though, <laughs> we got some stonks. Finally, Ryan Tannehill, two TDs in, last, in the last 14 or 15 games. Saw that on Twitter. Uh, I forgot who it was from. I think it was like John, Paul, John Paulson from 4 for 4. Shout out to him. Uh, but AJ Brown balled out again, got a deep so ball. Good. Where do you have him in your dynasty rankings? I haven't moved him up, but like, Top honestly, three. I was, I was pretty low on him just because of the whole regression shit. I've mm-hmm. learned a lot through these past, this past year, in my personal life and my professional life, my professional life is talking football that if you're good at football regression, like is just a fake seven letter word. <laughs> definitely doesn't have seven letters in it. I, I just guessed that. <laughs> He's really good. He just scores a touchdown every single week. I thought he was going to regress. He kicked me right in the teeth and said, no, nah, I'm going to score like nine touchdowns in five weeks. For me, he's probably top five. I got to move him up there with the likes of Devontae, DK, and uh, like Justin Jefferson, those type. He's a little bit further behind Justin Jefferson, but like all those guys are just, they're so good. They're so young. They're just producing. Uh, yeah. That's where he's at for me. Yeah, he's top three for me. I got Tyreek Hill, my wide receiver one. I've been saying that since June. People are finally waking up that shit. Uh, and that got DK, AJ Brown. Those are my top three wide receivers. But uh, yeah, Justin Jefferson's up there. And honestly, that whole cluster of wide receivers, if you can trade down, like if you can trade AJ Brown into Justin Jefferson plus, if you can trade DK into, you know, CeeDee Lamb, Justin Jefferson plus, like th- those are the moves you want to make in Dynasty is trading down the wide receiver position because there's so many good ones. They're so deep. We've got another class coming in as well. So it's all good. All good news for AJ Brown. I Real mean, quick, because uh, we just touched on the Washington football team. And I think I saw you tweet about it with Terry McLaurin and these other guys. 
where do you have him? Because I have trouble ranking him. I had the same trouble last year because I'm like, oh, I want to see year two of him doing it. He's doing it. The only issue is the quarterback situation. He is a little bit older than these guys, but I think he's the type of receiver where, like, it doesn't really matter. Like, he's just going to run out of the slot once he turns 35 and be, like, Blair Fitzgerald type of number. So, like, I'm not too worried about the whole age thing. For me, it's situation-based, but to this point, he's shown that the situation really doesn't matter. The only thing hindering him is, like, the weekly touchdown upside like an A.J. Brown and D.K. Metcalf have because they're in better offenses. Yeah, I got him at wide receiver 10, 9 or 10, like back back part of the top 10. Um, I have him like back to back with Calvin Ridley. And, uh, you know, I'm probably going to move him ahead of Calvin Ridley, to be honest. But in that group with like Justin Jefferson and CeeDee Lamb, I think like, you know, it's like a very similar thing with like A-Rob where like we hope that he gets a QB. Like we've been saying like A-Rob with a better QB would be much better for like fucking five years. Now he just keeps getting shut out. With, with <laughs> Remember people QB. thought Nick Foles is the answer. It's like, wow, this is the best quarterback <laughs> he's ever played with. Watch Nick Foles. Like, wow, this guy fucking stinks. <laughs> yeah, he fucking stinks. Like, I, I'm just afraid that like, you know, Terry McLaurin just kind of gets screwed over and over again. So I'm not going to move him assuming that he's going to get a good quarterback when you already have guys like AJ Brown and DK Metcalf who already had better quarterbacks. Mm-hmm. Um, guys like CeeDee Lamb once, uh, once Dak Prescott comes back. So I have him top 10. Uh, that's about as high as I can go on him. But again, like, you know, if I can flip, I can flip like a DK Metcalf or Terry McLaurin plus I'll, I'll do that immediately as well. Just wait till Logan Thomas gets under center. It's a wrap. Best quarterback on that team right now is playing tight end. We'll see him out there throwing dots like 80 yards down the field, and Terry's probably going to catch one of them. We got to see where they go and who they take in the draft. Um, if mm-hmm. they get like Justin Fields, fucking stocks up, man. Um, all right. Uh, who else we got? No one else want to talk about that game. Real quick now, Detroit, Minnesota. Detroit fucking stinks because Matt Patricia fucking stinks. Everyone, everything touches, man. I, we talked about this and I was so worried about Swift and people were like, ah, talent overcomes, talent overcomes. Like, no, man, fucking for running backs, talent does not overcome a shitty, shitty coach because they'll just pull you out. Like wide receivers, you're on the field, you're earning the target. It's a totally different story for running backs. DeAndre Swift, we still love the talent. We still believe in him. I think he is a buy low because we're assuming that Matt Patricia is gone. But if Matt Patricia is still here for another year, I'm fucking out. It's uh, crazy I, to me yeah. that they drafted Carrion Johnson in the second, and then they put LeGarrette Blount out there every single play, and he took his job. It's crazy to me that they drafted DeAndre Swift early second round. Then they signed Adrian Peterson off the, off the streets. He did not actually lead the team in snaps this week. It was DeAndre Swift, but he's still out there running passing routes for whatever reason, still getting goal line carries, still carrying the ball between the 20s. Like It just makes zero sense how they're utilizing him. And even when you think back to like the olden days, right, all the way yeah. back to Amir Abdullah former I think second or third round pick he scored a touchdown in this revenge game another guy who wasn't really given the reins despite him having what looked to be talent might be uh looking back hindsight maybe not too much talent there but I don't know the lines for running backs is just a complete shithole I I was hoping Daryl Bevel would like lean on DeAndre Swift back to what Mike said stinks this team stinks the situation stinks what's his name Chase Daniel is out there guy stinks Kenny Galladay is like dead he's not going to get re-signed this whole franchise is garbage and then on the other side of the ball they paid a running back whose name is Dalvin Cook and that guy's actually like really he really not stink. <laughs> speaking of not stinking fucking stonks for Dalvin Cook he is balling out of control he has multiple touchdowns basically damn near 200 yards from scrimmage and back-to-back games Granted, there are some cake matchups, but I don't care how easy the matchup is when you're balling to that degree. He's unstoppable. Uh, on, on the one play, though, he had a 70-yard touchdown. He's like, he's like the breakaway king in, 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 the, in the NFL because he's got the speed and he's got the cut. And if he makes that second-level defender miss in the open field, like, there's a, a strong chance he's taking it to the house. It's a wrap for him. He's, he's a fucking gazelle when he runs. And he's just I have a question running. for you, Mike. If he played the full season and Kirk Cousins played the full season, would Kirk Cousins have more passing yards than Dalvin Cook would have rushing yards? <laughs> if they played the full season? I think it would be close. I think the spread it, would be like plus 600. It, it'd be close. It depends on who they're, who they're facing. If they're facing cake matchups, then, then obviously I think Dalvin Cook could kind of get up there. But if they're facing uh, more stronger matchups, which is what, what's going to happen down the line, I think, I think Kirk will get up there. But yeah, Dalvin Cook, incredible. Just in my opinion, the best running back in the best pure runner in the NFL today. He is, he's just, he's just really fucking good. And I honestly, I was, I was thinking about trying to pull the trigger to trade for him in a league where I'm like, I'm seven and one, I'm in second place, but like, I'm a pretender because my team just like didn't put up that, that many points. So I didn't end up getting the deal done. And the main reason is because of the schedule. Like his schedule is brutal. He has like New Orleans Saints, Tampa Bay Bucks, and like Chicago Bears or something like that. Like three of the, three of the bottom, like, like stone worst matchups in the league granted you're not going to bench him because he's a fucking stud and i have him in a lot of leagues i'm going to play him every week but i, I just don't think he's going to be in line for for some of these monster weeks yeah um, i'm coming here chicago in chicago on monday night if he can do it against them who just shut down derrick henry 
then you can never really like think of him as anything less than a top three back. But then after that gets Dallas, Carolina, Jacksonville in a row, he's going to maybe put up like 300,000 mm-hmm. fantasy points in that stretch. But yep. then you're right in the playoffs, he gets at Tampa Bay, Chicago again, and at New Orleans. Those are extremely tough matchups. But when you're Dalvin Cook, you just got to think about it. Like he's going to catch passes because Kirk Cousins can't throw the ball. He's going to carry the ball 25 times. And there's a good chance one or two of those, even against these tough defenses. Like we just saw Alvin Kamara this past week. He didn't have a huge game, but he had a few nice runs. So did Latavius yep. Murray. All it takes is one, and he's enough. He's talented enough to be able to do that. I agree with you, though. Like, if you want to, like, pay up for him, not, th- not to say that you shouldn't just because of his schedule, but it, it should give you a little bit of hesitation. That, along with, like, the injury concerns that we have seen pop up throughout his career. But we, you posed a question last week. If he's healthy, I, I don't know if I would take Christian McCaffrey over him. If you can guarantee me a full 16-game season, uh, 16 game season it's it's a toss-up because McCaffrey is great, but this guy is he's he's right there alongside him. Yeah, if if health was not a concern, I mean he'd be way up there. And obviously he's he's on, a little bit on the older side, right? He's twenty six, so he's basically thirty next year. He retired um, already. He's <laughs> retired already, but but I think that that is also one one knock against him is just like the age. But he's going to be producing. He he just got paid. I think the, the 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 offense runs through Dalvin Cook. He's putting the notion of RBs don't matter to the absolute freaking test. I mean, I personally think running back shouldn't get paid and I still don't think they should get paid but I just love watching Dalvin Cook play he's exciting so speaking of Christian McCaffrey we're talking about the Kansas City versus Carolina game lots of stonks in this game and it was super stonks until this morning when I learned that Christian McCaffrey has a fucking shoulder injury so that stinks uh, because I had him on my team so I was excited to get him back and my favorite thing Mike sorry to cut you off is Dr. Jesse Morris yesterday which was Sunday we're recording this on a Monday put out a video talking about Christian McCaffrey's rib injury that he didn't end up having, which is now like an AC joint sprain, SC joint sprain, two letters. He sprained them. Uh, It looks like he's doubtful for this week, but then the coach said he's day to day. Who knows? The guy just sat like seven weeks with a high ankle sprain, which looked to be the, the right choice because he looked spry out there. Then on like one of the last plays of the game, he's out. If he misses next week, and somebody happened to drop Mike Davis. I know they played Tampa Bay, but Mike Davis, the last time they played Tampa Bay in like a partial game, had like nine receptions or some bullshit. He's yep. going to slot right back into that role. But I think also if he's out, Curtis Samuel, he's somebody you got to play week in and week out. He's becoming a real weapon. He's what we all wanted DJ Moore to be. DJ Moore to be. He's getting exactly. red zone carries. He's getting peppered with targets. I think he went like nine for 105 yesterday. And of course, they were playing from behind in the end to try to catch up. But he's a huge part of this offense. He's like rivaling Robbie Anderson in terms of usage. And I think. For this season, at least, he's he's jumped DJ more in terms of fantasy relevance. Yeah, yeah, I I was a huge fan of Curtis Samuel going back. I still like DJ more a lot more, but you know it's kind of good to see him putting it together. I think look, Christian McCaffrey came back and went right back to his fucking role. He had ten targets, ten catches, eighty two yards. That's why you love him. I mean, nobody gets receptions like Christian McCaffrey except for Alvin Kamara when MT is gone. Um, but that's for another day. I think on the Chiefs side, I I've had. Uh, Tyreek Hill is my wide receiver one, dynasty wide receiver one, since about, I think, May or June. Caught a lot of slack for that. He's looking he's looking the part. I mean, he's getting – he got 18 targets, only nine receptions, but that's what you get with Tyreek Hill. Two touchdowns, 100 yards. Looks like a freaking baller. Travis Kelsey stonks up. I traded for him in two contending leagues, tight end premiums. He's going to put me to the championship because I saw they had Dallas – in the championship weeks, which is fucking just money. He's going to get, a, he's going to get like double digit targets for sure. So look, stonks up for them. Stonks up for Patrick Mahomes. Stonks fucking down for Clyde Edwards, Clyde Edwards, a layer playing a goddamn satellite back. He had five carries for 14 yards. Granted, they did not run the ball like at all this game. Um, I mean, they were going toe to toe with Carolina Panthers, but you hate to see that. I'm still a believer in Clyde Edwards, a layer long-term, um, but you know, he's definitely not that workhorse that we thought it could be once uh, Damian, Her- Damian uh, Williams, uh opted out where, where do you have Kyle right now do you have Dobbins ahead of him yet I think I'm going to have to move him ahead of him I mean J.K. Dobbins has looked great when he's gotten the ball and of course Clyde Edwards Hilaire started off really strong he does he I think he's like top 10 or like almost top five in total yards for the running back position maybe that changed after this past week but There's no James Robinson <laughs> yeah, James Robinson might be like the 101 in like both rookie and startup drafts but uh talking to Clyde Edwards Hilaire yeah it's just weird because against the Jets a blowout he didn't get the usage we hoped he would get neither did Le'Veon Bell then in this game they basically split snaps again I think it's just a situation this year at least I'm not sure about the future where it's like hey we're the Chiefs we don't need to run the ball because mm-hmm. Mahomes can just throw it whenever he wants it's going to be a touchdown and I think that they're just smart enough to be like hey we're just going to keep yep. we're not going to show you our hand we're just going to roll out different running backs every single time because we want all three of these guys healthy for the playoffs. And if that means Clyde Edwards-Hilaire is only seeing like eight to 12 touches a game and like a 45 to 50% snap share, 
it's probably going to happen. And there's no better team to run against than the Panthers. And I know they're playing from behind for a lot of the game, but they didn't really take advantage of that portion of the game, that portion of the field. So I am a little bit nervous for this year. He's looking to be like a back end RB2, high end RB3, which isn't what you drafted him to be. Yeah. But for dynasty purposes, I just think that the draft capital, they sunk in him. The fact that Le'Veon Bell probably won't be back unless he takes like a major pay cut from what he was expecting in New York to play mm-hmm. there and hopefully try to win another title uh, yeah. in 2022. Like, I don't know. I just, I, I still have faith in him in terms of dynasty, but the way that JK Dobbins has looked, he is overtaking Gus Edwards. I see no reason for Mark Ingram to ever touch a football again uh, in that offense. I would probably rank JK Dobbins ahead of him at this point. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of kind of like where I'm at. It just depends on if it's PPR or not. But he's not really getting that much that much game in the target section as well. So, um, yeah, for redraft, big disappointment for Dynasty. Still in. Next up, the game, a game that I thought would be all stinks, actually um, has some moderate stonks. So if we look at it, Jacksonville versus Houston, number one stonks. James Robinson continues to fucking ball out. Uh, I will say that um, Chris Thompson coming back obviously had an impact on his target share. Um, he was getting like four or five targets a game before Chris Thompson came back. So obviously that's a dinger. Chris Thompson, assuming he won't be here next year. I actually think James Robinson will be here next year. Hopefully they draft the Justin Fields uh, and that offense will kind of be humming, but he stonks up for me. And if you're still fading James Robinson, get the fuck out of dynasty, man. Cause you're a coward. You're still trying to cash out for like rookie picks and shit. Like you, your dream is to turn into a rookie pick into a workhorse. And he has been by far in my, by my, in my opinion, the best performing rookie running back thus far. Uh, what do you think? Your thoughts of Dave Robinson? Yeah, yeah, by a wide margin. He's consistently produced. I know the last time they played the Texans, it was like a juicy matchup, and he did nothing. But mm-hmm. he's had realistically like two down games, being an undrafted free agent, not even – probably not even like having the confidence. So he probably has the confidence because you're in the NFL. But like he didn't know he was going to make the team. He didn't know Leonard Fournette was going to be cut. He goes into the season getting the workhorse role because two guys get put on the COVID list, one's injured, whatever, and he just performs – he catches pass out of the backfield. I know this week he didn't, but he's probably on pace at this point for like 50 receptions over like, I'm making these numbers up, but it just feels right. Like 1200 rushing yards and like double digit touchdowns. As you said, nobody drafted him in their rookie drafts, getting that off of the waiver wire in a dynasty league or in like the fifth round or whatever. That's a, as big of a win as you can get. I know probably early in the season we were advocating for like, Oh yeah, sell him for a late first, sell him for an early two. At this point, it's really hard to sell him because the value that he's going to give you from here on out throughout the rest of the season if you're a contender is going to be huge and even if you're not a contender you get a young running back in an up-and-coming offense that hopefully has a new quarterback next year it's really hard to sell him for anything unless you're getting a known piece in return or a known like mid to high first round pick which most people probably wouldn't pay for a guy like james robinson yep exactly um i think that's definitely the case and on the other side of the ball though i mean will fuller is a wide receiver one. He's just lock him in. If he's healthy, he's a wide receiver one. Man, that Jacksonville um, Jaguar secondary is so stinks. sorry. That touchdown he scored, he just like, stopped running, jumped for no reason, and then just ran <laughs> again. Like the quarterback just went to the bench and like sat on the sideline. They stink. Brandon Cooks like took a little yeah. drag route like 50 yards to the house. Their secondary is – Stinks. Start everyone. AFC South is just trash. I hate it. Yeah, start everyone against the Jacksonville secondary. I mean, Deshaun Watson continues to ball out. I think I don't think he scored below top ten QB ever since Billy Bob O'Brien left the town. So um, that's good news for him. And it was good news that they didn't fire sell off Will Fuller and Brandon Cooks. That would have been bad for Deshaun Watson in terms of production. So top five. Hey, still Kenny Stills and uh, who else? <laughs> Kuti yeah. and Randall yeah. Cobb. Yeah, top five QB rest of season lock. Top five QB dynasty lock. Uh, not much more to talk about. Next Has he game. Lamar Jackson for you in Dynasty? Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, next game, speaking of Lamar Jackson, fucking stonks. This game – actually, I didn't mean stonks. I meant stinks. This game fucking <laughs> stinks because Jonathan Taylor was looking was looking good, and then he fucking fumbled it and got benched. So yeah, I don't think he was looking at all, honestly. Like, this <laughs> guy – I joke <laughs> that he runs with his eyes closed. He is – it's crazy to me that we what we saw out of him at Wisconsin was, like, such good vision between the tackles. He's only been good this year when running off tackle or like in the screen game. He can't create any yards for himself. And the one time he picks up more than three yards on a carry, guess what he does? He reverts to his old ways, fumbles, gets benched. Jordan Wilkins and Naheem Hines out snap him. I know his schedule is good, but it's just like David Montgomery that we talked about. This is a complete timeshare on an offense that has Philip fucking Rivers behind center. I don't care if they play the Jaguars the next like six weeks, weeks straight. I have zero confidence in JT for the rest of the season. Hopefully in the offseason, he learns how to open up his eyes, watches Bird Box a few times. He's like, oh, shit, maybe I should take the blindfold off. Next season, I still have hope for him because he is this athletic freak that was 
awesome in college, had an awesome college profile, put up 2,000 yards, three straight seasons at Wisconsin, which like Monty Ball did. So I don't really know what's going on there. Um, but I don't know. It's, it's really concerning his rookie year, what's going on there, despite having a good offensive line and an offense that obviously wants to run the ball. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's incredible. I would say, I would say, look, I'm still in on JT. I believe in his talent. I think it's too early to write him off. I think he showed, he showed some stuff. I mean, vision, obviously, a, a problem. Adjust, adjusting the NFL is an issue. I think Frank Reich is a big problem. The play calling is a big problem. The O-line is a big problem. They have not performed up to par in terms of what we thought they would be. One of the big reasons why we dropped the JT. So, big disappointment there. Speaking of Phillip Rivers, his attempt at a tackle was the sorriest looking shit I've ever seen in my entire life. Like a baby on his back. Like a, like a turtle on his back, legs in the air, flailing. It was sad. If He's I, if been I on his back at least nine times confirmed in his life. Yeah. So. He has to <laughs> – yeah, I, I feel for his kids. I mean, watching your father get embarrassed on national TV like that can't be, can't be feeling good. But anyways, other than that, I mean, the entire, entire offense stinks on the Colts' side. Baltimore Ravens, I mean, minor stonks, but for the, for the most part, still stinks. Hollywood Brown not getting much move. Uh, Mark Andrews, huge bust, huge bust. I mean, I, I thought he was like, I thought he was the next big deal, and he's just not putting it together at all. That you know what the issue about saying that, Mike, is together. like next week he's going to score three touchdowns. So we're going to be right <laughs> yeah. back on. <laughs> yeah, but that's, that's still a huge disappointment. I mean, mm-hmm. I thought he's, I thought he's in the approach like the, the Chelsea tier. Right now, I've moved T.J. Hawkinson above him in my dynasty ranks. I've always loved T.J. Hawkinson. He was my late-round tight end target, and he's been balling out. He's currently the tight end three, tight end four overall on a points-per-game basis. So I've moved T.J. Hawkinson ahead of him. Um, Noah Fant is in that conversation as well. But to Mark Andrews, huge, huge, huge disappointment. Um, yeah, Mark Jackson, just isn't there. Like Even in a tight end premium league, you're not getting the volume like in terms of yeah. reception <clears throat> numbers for it to really matter. You're just banking on touchdowns at this point, which is really disappointing because he's obviously extremely talented. He does drop a lot of passes, but – like. When you look at the surrounding weapons and it's like Willie Sneed and I'm not even sure if Chris Moore is in the NFL anymore, but like, why don't you just throw to this guy like five times every yeah. game, which like sounds like nothing, but he's not even like reaching that threshold. I think Nick Boyle out snapped him this week. And I know yeah. Mark Andrews isn't an every down player, but when Nick Boyle's on the field more than somebody with this type of talent, and I know it was kind of like a blowout, but like, you just got to get him the ball because he makes yeah. plays happen when it's in his hands and he scores a ton of touchdowns. It's just really disappointing. This whole Ravens offense, like, it, it just caps the ceiling of so many seemingly good fantasy assets like a Marquise Brown, like a Mark Andrews, and even a J.K. Dobbins. When you put Gus Edwards out there on the goal line, getting three straight carries, getting stuffed on two, and finally making it in on the third, it's, it's just really disappointing right now. Yep. Next game, Buffalo versus Seattle. Josh Allen bounce back season to his MVP form. This Seattle defense, I will say, is one of the worst defenses of all time, of all time. Uh, rivals the uh, Aaron Rodgers. I think someone tweeted out like they're on pace to smash the Aaron Rodgers 2011 defense, which was which was like bottom bottom tier. You could do anything. How about Dallas Pittsburgh. of this year prior to like this week against Pittsburgh? Dude, I mean Dallas looks better than Seattle to be honest. I mean this Seattle like you cannot they cannot stop anything. They cannot stop wide receivers. They got Josh Jamal Allen, Adams back. Let up 44 points. Yeah, Josh Buffalo. Allen just bent him over. I mean everyone was scoring points on the Buffalo offense. Uh, I mean, yeah, it's just, it stinks. Their, their, their entire defense stinks. But what that means for fantasy is stonks. DK Metcalf is fucking unstoppable. Russell Wilson had probably his worst game we've seen in a long time. Turned the ball over like four times, two interceptions, had like a fumble as well. Just, just not good from that perspective for fantasy purposes. DK Metcalf, one ham, seven for 108, one touchdown. He's unstoppable. DK Metcalf is unstoppable. Top, five, top three dynasty wide receiver. Some people have him number one. Respect that. But he, he just looks he just looks really good. I mean, Josh Allen, Stephon Diggs looking like the wide receiver one we all thought he was. John Brown, healthy back, again, just a wide receiver too. Both just really, really good wide receivers. Yeah, it's like sneakily one of the best wide receiver duos in the league. It's Stephon Diggs and yep. John Brown. They just get open at will. I mean, against yep. Seattle, like I could get open at will, but they just – they're always <laughs> open. Every game that they play, it seems like it's – Stephon Diggs is basically a lock for like – eight catches for 111 yards and maybe we'll score. Yep. John Brown is like six catches for at least 75 yards every game. And then Cole Beasley like sometimes shows up, but other times he puts up like three for 39 like this one. So uh, it's, it's kind of a Russian roulette where you get like two good bullets and the third one's Cole Beasley. Yeah. And then rushing, you don't want any part of this rushing offense. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the funniest quote I saw was like Pete Carroll's like, we had a really good plan for the rushing attack, uh, but they didn't really rush it. So <laughs> he's like, like, whoops. All right. So they didn't prepare for anything. Buffalo was like, hey, on the other hand, Buffalo was like, yo, Seattle fucking stinks in the past. All we're going to do is pass. Devin Singletary, two carries for one yard. No part of that. You don't want any part of this uh, fucking rushing. Josh Allen's, Josh Allen's RB1. Zach Moss, like flex 
weekly flex appeal potentially depending on the matchup. So not much more to say there. I mean, Denver versus Atlanta. I don't even want to talk about this game. Everyone fucking Drew Locke is the new Blake Bortles. It's just automatic garbage yeah. time in the second half. I don't yeah. I don't like him at all. I mean, like this might be personal. I just don't like Drew Locke. The guy like celebrates when he's down by a million points. The Falcons almost blew it. Yeah. Um, but Julio Jones is still an animal. This Broncos defense is sneaky, like one of the worst units in the entire league. They just Bad. they give up so many points. Like Herbert tore him apart. Falcons tore him apart. Derek Carr next week is going to tear him apart. And uh, it looks like the next game we have to talk about might be these Raiders and what Derek. Wow, Carr Cam Newton rushing touchdown, RB one for the New York <laughs> Patriots. Um, yeah, look, the, 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 that game stinks. I mean, Jared Judy finally had a blow-up game. Good for him. KJ Hamler saw a little bit of light. Good for him. Lost uh, Big Al, Albert uh, Okumbo, blah, 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 whatever his name, last name is. Nailed it. Um, um, <laughs> lost him to an ACL, which is sad because he was having a pretty good breakout season. He was a tight end one of the class, uh, by our estimation, because of, of his combat metrics. But, yeah, nothing more to really see there. Ridley was out, obviously. Um, and then, you know, I, I think there was, like a, there was like a little bit of a breakout, I guess, wide receiver, if you want to call it that. But I'm – I'm personally not really like at this point in the season for redraft, you're not looking to stash like these fringe wide receiver plays anymore. So like as much as people are going after Olamide, Zacchaeus, uh, whatever his name is. Yeah. I these names really are fucking us up right now. We just got to skip this one. <laughs> yeah. I wouldn't really waste much time on that. Okay. So not much to say there. Next up, pain train, pain town for our boy Noah, uh, LA Chargers. Versus can I tell Las you how Vegas sad Rams. I am, Mike? Just Las honestly, Vegas. can I tell you how sad I am? Like deep down, I really want this team to win. And then, like, I mask it behind my feelings. Like, oh, if they lose, we'll have a high pick. We'll get somebody good. Knowing even further down, we're going to fuck that pick up. So I'm like, <laughs> okay, why don't we try this out? Why don't we try to win? What I don't understand. First off, like, Mike Williams, and I tweeted it. That final, the second to last play where he jumped up 80,000 inches in the air, mossed somebody, dropped it, and then got hurt, was the epitome of his career. He, <laughs> yeah. people, he gets hurt and he drops passes. That's all you need to know about him. I might make a Mike Williams career tribute and just put that one play just so people <laughs> know who he is. Second off, you get the second opportunity. Keenan Allen is tearing these guys apart. Wide open every single play. You know what we're going to do? We're going to overload one side and put Keenan Allen over there. And we're going to put fucking, <laughs> I don't even know his first name, Parham all by himself. He's 6'8". I'm 6'4". You're not going to throw to me out there. He goes yeah. up Mosses. The announcer's like, oh, shit, he caught it. When you can clearly see upon the first <laughs> replay, he dropped it. And then, like, there was there was so much pain. There, like, Donald, my heart fell so deep into my chest yeah. that I thought I might just pass away. I mean, Don, honestly, Donald, I wish I did. Donald Parham, three targets, zero receptions. I think that's that's all you really need to know about that. Well, player. he had one reception for about two minutes, and then, it, like, got wiped <laughs> off the board and they lost. Yeah, look, I think, you know, the, the the talent is there, right? You got Keenan Allen, you got Mike Williams, you got Justin Herbert, uh, you got Hunter Goose Egg, and you know you got obviously got Austin Eckler coming back, um, Kalen Garbage putting up some stats. But it's all it comes down to coaching, right? Like if you look at uh, Warren uh, Warren Sharp had a really good thread, and I I said this on the Mark Watch Monday as well. When you lose that many close games, and in the last few minutes, it's down to coaching. It's no longer it's no longer on the players because like it's down to these last minute decisions. If you look at how they ran that like final two minutes, like run on first down in the middle. No, they like I, I didn't see a single goddamn target towards the uh, towards the sidelines. They could have to Mike Williams at one time and he couldn't get out of bounds. He just jumped for it in the air <laughs> yeah. again and fell down and almost yeah. got hurt. It's like yeah, but so you got to you got to scheme that shit. Like they could have they could have easily had like. They could have been easily in, like, the goal line, right, and had, like, three or four chances of, like, 30, 40 seconds if they just managed the clock. And they didn't because Anthony Lynn's a fucking idiot, and he wants to run kill and kill and garbage when you got Justin Herbert the God back there just slinging, slinging, slinging dimes. So it's just down to coaching. It's a sad, sad reality for you. Until you guys change coaching, I just don't see it changing. Uh, Were you that. watching that game? Did you yeah. see when he got hurt on the touchdown? I, oh, yeah. I like, almost cried. I, like, <laughs> yeah, dude. Guy that, like, I hated in the offseason. He's been so good. He like apparently just got like kicked in the nuts and he was like yeah. killing it. And they bring out Tyrod and he looked like he was straight out of Tech Mobile until he reached the one yard line and got stuffed. But yeah, I mean, they get that two point conversion and that last drive is a field goal that's going to overtime, which would have just been like more pain in overtime yeah. watching Derek Carr throw to Nelson Aguilar like seventy yards for a touchdown. But, yeah, like, I, I, I mean the fact that the fact that they were like basically after the game they're like Justin Herbert was ready to go back in, but they didn't want to waste the timeout, so they used Tyrod. It's like dude, waste the timeout. You had a chance to tie the fucking game. And you think it's a waste to put your real quarterback in? Like these are the types of decisions that just blow your mind. Anyways, Chargers organization fucking stinks, except for Keenan Allen and uh, Austin Eckler and Justin Herbert. Next game, I don't want to talk about it. Pittsburgh versus Dallas fucking stinks everywhere. Everybody, everybody stinked in this game. Just Big Ben got hurt. Uh, I think he hurt his knee a little bit, so kind of watch out for that because 
Rudolph, Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer went in there for like two minutes, and that entire offense fucking took a dump. They fucking Apparently, stink. Ben hurt both of his knees, which means he's like the healthiest he's ever been. So, I, I don't know. This guy <laughs> plays through everything. Juju Smith-Schuster, like, gets hype every time he catches a pass, and, like, he tore up the Cowboys defense. Congrats. I still, like, I'd still much rather have Deontay Johnson um, and Claypool rest of season. And I think in Dynasty, they're ahead of him right now. Maybe that's a little foolish by me because he's probably going to change teams and get more opportunity. But Claypool is an animal. He's uh, dominating targets there. And I think I'd rather have him than Juju than Juju in Dynasty. I think between Deontay and Juju, it's a toss-up for me. Yeah, I, I still got Juju a little bit up there just banking on that age, and, and he is getting some work with, uh, with Big Ben. But, yeah, Claypool getting all the targets. So you love to see that. Um, next game, we do want to talk about this. There's a lot of stonks in this game. Right? Miami versus Cardinals. We talked about this a lot. Big fan of what the organization has done in terms of their turnaround. They basically, you know, people thought they were tanking. People, season ticket holders were trying to sue them and shit. But now look at them one year later, post-case era. Love what Brian Flores is doing. Loving what the front office is doing. Investing in the place that matters. Tua, Tua has been incredible uh, in this game. I mean, he, I, don't, I don't want to call it a flawless game, but I think – in terms of his second game as a rookie, he played about as well as he could. He showed everything we saw in college in terms of his ball placement, being able to throw throw it on a rope to anywhere he can because that's exactly what he had to do because Patrick Peterson was draped all over these receivers. Preston Williams, he was draped all over Devontae Parker. But when crunch, crunch time came and push came to shove, Tua freaking delivered. And, I think the and most impressive thing and maybe the most shocking thing is how willing he is to run outside oh, yeah. of the pocket like throwing on the run he was impeccable yeah and also just like running for actual yardage and not being afraid to take a hit and I thought that's yeah. something that he might be a little bit nervous about because of like how many times he's been injured whether it's his ankle or his hip but he looked mobile out there he looked good this rookie uh, running or I just named every position other than one I wanted to say quarterback class it's it's yeah. early but it might be one of the better ones we've ever seen because all yeah. three of these guys can do it on the ground in terms of fantasy production like they can do it on the ground They've shown to be extremely accurate, and they're on offenses that have already shown trust in them despite their first year out there, first week out there. I just – I don't know. I think people were doubting two after one week, and I kind of doubted him after that, like, little throw to the sideline where he just, like, threw an interception for no reason. I think he got turned over or whatever. But, like, it, he, he looked great. Herbert's looked great. Burroughs looked great. We're, we're in a good spot. This league is in very good hands. Yeah, we, I talked about this on the Market Watch Mondays. The quarterback position is probably as strong as it has ever been uh, with these young guys. And then we also have 2021 coming in with Justin Fields and T-Law. So, it, okay, buckle up, buckle up. We're in for some fireworks for these next few years. We definitely got it loaded. I mean, after suffering some shitty, shitty quarterback play after all the injuries and all these old guys rolling off, I think we're definitely in a good spot. Um, not much else to talk about. I mean, Preston Williams got hurt, so that sucks. But Kyler Murray, man, he's doing what, Lamar, what we thought Lamar Jackson would do absolutely lighting it up on the ground he's got 11 carries 101 yards he put up an rb1 performance and a qb1 performance in the same game he is an rb1 and a qb1 uh, separately on the season uh is he the qb1 i mean i, I think mahomes probably still qb1 but if you want to put Kyler murray up there i have no no arguments against it he has been incredible um i would say the one thing though chase edmonds uh got way too overhyped because what we're, what we're seeing is like that lead running back role is just not a lucrative one you don't want it you don't want it it's like it's like it's like a fucking it's like a fucking I don't know like a bologna sandwich that that was made by your by your stinky aunt uh, that's unwilling to put like I must have done I don't know started, like don't personal know. you like dug deep into memories like, <laughs> I'm just putting bologna it in sandwich it stinks yeah. real bad I don't want it yeah, no, I think what on. we learned also is like they weren't afraid to give him the ball he had 25 carries I'm not sure how many catches he had I would say like three you know, he finished three so 28 touches on the game what we just learned is like every time you have a starting running back in Arizona, they're going to get vultured on the goal line because Kyler Murray is just going to take that little read option and go by himself because he's such a good runner. He's elusive. And he's, I don't know how many rushing touchdowns he has in the season. Isn't it like seven already? Yeah, he's he's uh, he's on pace for like double digit rushing touchdowns, which is actually kind of absurd. absurd. Yeah, so Chase Edmonds, if Kenyon Drake is out again next week, I think they have a pretty easy matchup. Uh, I, I would slot him in as a back in RB1 because of volume alone. But as Mike said, like, I don't think his value in terms of like in a vacuum is going to change all too much when he goes back to the backup position. I think he's just can be viewed. I know I just said like a back in RB1 this week, but I think like the starting running back in Arizona compared to Ed Edmonds being the backup, it's like a middling RB2, middling to back in RB2 type of job. Yep. Yep. That's totally true. I mean, next up the game, a lot of stinking on the Tampa Bay Bucks. Their defense stinks. Their Tom Brady played one of the worst games I've ever seen, throwing it up there, like throwing like fucking, what's that game called? Like 500. Um, uh, or jackpot toss, or whatever. Yeah, jackpot, 500, whatever you call it, where you basically toss it up and, and just yeah, let anyone catch it. Call it 500. Um, it, <laughs> yeah, it was, it, was, it was bad. I mean, the entire offense stunk. 
Uh, Ronald Jones didn't do anything. Leonard Fournette just can't break tackles still. As, That's so as, disappointing as to me too because Ronald Jones looked legit like for that yeah. three-game stretch. And then Arians just seems to have something out for him where like if he makes a simple mistake, whether it's a blitz pickup or a drop or a fumble, I know like you want to punish these guys, but the extent to which he punishes them for the type of running back that Ronald Jones is, he needs to get, you know, 18 to 20 carries to get in rhythm the fact that you're going to sit him for two quarters and then you want him to get back in rhythm in the fourth quarter I know this game they didn't run at all I think it was like the least amount of running plays ever in any NFL yeah. game it was like four. five rushes five rushes and one of them was for Blaine Gabbert which was a kneel down I think so yeah four. like you just the type of running back he is you can't just like continue to spell him obviously you want to put Leonard Fournette out there on third down or yeah on third downs but like I don't know I have no hope for it's Ronald Jones the rest of the season he has a fantastic schedule but he had a fantastic it's schedule crazy. a few weeks ago too. And it was just like, it's the same shit. It's like, they don't trust him enough to keep putting him out there. And if he's not getting consistent volume, uh, drive after drive, snap after snap, it's like, you're not going to get much out of him. Yeah. The one thing I want to, I want to cover in this game. I think that is important. I tweeted this out a little bit earlier as well. I was like Alvin Kamara splits with him without Michael Thomas is pretty drastic. I mean, when Michael Thomas went down, I was like, Alvin Kamara is going to be like rest of the season RB1 because without Alvin, the Michael Thomas, he averages like nine targets. Um, and then with Michael Thomas, he's closer to like five or six, which is still elite. He's still a top low, top loaded, uh, top three top top three running back rest of the season but just don't be expecting those types of like cmc level production because michael thomas back you saw it immediately even though it's a bit of a weird game uh, michael thomas led the team with six targets alvin kamara uh back down uh tied with the team lead for six targets but i don't think you're going to be seeing too many of those like double digit target games anymore going forward for alvin kamara he actually got all carried by the davis murray on the ground but i think that has more to do with game script so just be on the lookout for that alvin kamara still going to lock him in you're going to start him every single week because he's a god but just uh, temper expectations a bit if you're still trying to think about those CMC. Or, or no, actually, no. That better comparison now is the Dalvin Cook-type performances where he puts up like 40 and 50 burgers. I think those are going to be few and far in between. Um, that's all I want to talk about. I don't want to talk about the Packers versus, uh, versus the San Francisco 49ers game. Yeah. The game fucking stunk. So not much to talk about there other than Adams is still a god. Aaron Jones is a god. Um, I think we learned that. also that like when a player is going to be limited and they keep saying he's going to be limited, that doesn't matter at all. Like McCaffrey saw 30 touches. Yeah, that doesn't matter. Aaron Jones got like the first six touches of the game. Like it doesn't matter unless you're Ezekiel Elliott and you like, you're not really limited. He's still got a, t- a ton of like touches, but when you play Pittsburgh and you're not hundred percent, you're going to put up yeah. like seven points, like what he did. Yeah. yeah. Aaron Jones, 20 touches, 15 carries, five targets, five catches. He's just, he's just the God. I mean, mm-hmm. he's nothing, nothing to complain about there, but that's all I want to cover for the games. I think real quickly though, we want to talk a little bit about um, like strategy going into the rest of the season. Right. Because, you know, I, I, I tweeted this earlier today and, and what I said was like, you got to stop playing the waiver markets. If you're, if you're in redrafts right now, stop playing waivers and wasting the fab bidding on, bidding on like Zacchaeus and all these like fringe wide receivers. You don't know if you're going to start or not. What you want to do is start shoring up your bench with like low probability hits, but very high upside auto starts when they hit. And what I mean by that is probably like handcuffs, right? So guys like Latavius Murray, league winning upside. If Alvin Kamara goes down, locked in RB1, you're starting him every week. If he's on your roster, if he's on your waivers, get him. Uh, Giovanni Bernard, we already saw he's the running back one, right? Alexander Madison, Tony Pollard. Um, these, these are the types of guys you want to stash uh, at the back at the back part of your bench. So if, if they are available, and I see on Yahoo and ESPN leagues, they're like probably like only like 30 to 40% roster, which means in half leagues, they are available. You should be snatching those types of guys up. If you have, if you own Dalvin Cook, you should be trying to get Alexander Madison to protect because the playoff picture is now clear, right? You're not trying to play for value anymore in redraft. Like trades rarely happen during this time of the year. So what you want to do is really protect your starting lineup and just shore up your starting lineup and where you, how you shore it up is by going after the running back position and making sure you protect. And even if you don't own Dalvin Cook, get Alexander Madison. Even if you don't own Alvin Kamara, get Latavius Murray because if those guys go down, that is a league winning move. And that's what you should be focused on going forward for these waivers. Yeah, we saw with Mike Davis. I know like a lot of people didn't have faith in him because his one game without, without Christian McCaffrey, like the second half that he played was like eight, eight targets and like one carry. It's like, oh, he's not going to be anything. Then he gets the workhorse role, and he was basically a top five running back for like a five to six week stretch. It might be the same situation again. They have a bye in week 13. If McCaffrey's injury seems to be somewhat serious, I'm not so sure that they're going to push him to play before the bye. Obviously, like if it doesn't come out to be anything serious, it's just like a, a sprain. I'm no doctor. I don't know what that means. They might push him to play before then. But like if you can get Mike Davis again for another five game stretch, four or five game stretch, uh, go out there and blow your fab. I'm pretty sure like. Most people didn't drop him, but if they did drop him and pick up a guy like Jordan Howard for a spot start this week, go out and grab him because just like Mike said, like even if McCaffrey comes back, if he gets hurt again, we see the upside of a guy like Mike Davis, of a guy like Tony Pollard, uh, of a guy even like Benny Snell. 
Like, you know what these guys are going to be if the lead back goes down. Sure, the schedule isn't always the best, and sure, they're not as talented as the guys starting there. But anytime you can get that sort of volume um, and that sort of workload, you got to do it for the cheap. Because as you said, like picking up like a couple frauds that had decent performances, even a guy like Jordan Wilkins, like it's going to be a timeshare there. He needs both other guys to get hurt for him to be a workhorse. Uh, or who else like had a decent game this week? Like even a Kalen Balaj, like Eckler's probably going to be back. Justin Jackson's probably going to be back. Josh Kelly somehow still gets play. Um, it, it's just not worth it. Instead, you just, you just pick up like a clear cut handcuff who could win you a league like a Jamal Williams type. Mm-hmm, exactly. And and if we kind of look at the schedule, right, um, and you can kind of find a lot of this stuff on uh, sharpfootballstats.com. But if you look at like some of the defensive efficiency opponents, I mean, Titans, Tennessee Titans, Chicago Bears, uh, LA Rams, Miami Dolphins, and Baltimore Ravens have some of the best um, have some of the best schedules going forward in terms of uh, overall defense. If you look at rushing defensive opponents, though, Miami Dolphins actually number one. Uh, so they have a pretty easy going, and that's that's good for Miles Gaskins when he's back in like three weeks. He's on IR right now, but once he's back, we saw he had kind of had that workload, uh, workhorse workload. This team is good. Their defense is good and keeping him in the games. Tua we know is good because we've kind of already started to see that. So I think that's one. That's a sneaky play that I really like if you can kind of make a move. He's somebody that I'm not afraid to buy low on either. We know he's probably going to be back after I think he comes back week 13. You look at his schedule there after, like you were saying, even if he comes back, I'm just, can he come back week 12? Yeah, he can come back week 12. Yep. From there on out, he gets the Jets, Cincinnati, Kansas City, New England, and Las Vegas. Yep. Like he could legit be a top 12 running back over that span. We just saw this week that they don't really have anybody else that they trust on this offense. Maybe DeAndre Washington for the next two weeks when he's able to play after like passes the COVID protocol uh, gets a little run out there. But we saw what Miles Gaskin is. He beat out Brita, who they paid in the offseason. He beat out Jordan Howard, who they paid in the offseason. Uh, Patrick Laird, who everybody thinks is good. He beat him out too. He's, he's a workhorse. He's getting like 18 to 20 touches a game when he's active. This defense is going to create a lot of short fields, especially against a team like the Jets and uh, against Cincinnati. They're probably going to sack him a few times, get a few turnovers. Short fields, a lot of passing down work. Um, he's somebody I'm willing to buy low on because somebody who owns him that is on the brink of making the playoffs, they're not going to be able to comfortably hold on to him for the next two, three weeks when he isn't playing. You can probably get him pretty cheap and give that owner somebody who's like a decent play, like a Zach Moss or some bullshit. They might take it because they might think that Zach Moss is good at football, which he isn't. Yep, exactly. And I think I think he's he's just a sneaky he's a really sneaky buy. I think one one sneaky buy that people want you to buy that you should totally fade is David Montgomery because we talked about this a little bit earlier. Like David Montgomery's a trap, right? Like because like everyone in DFS, I don't know how many people lost money on him this this year. Uh, I just faded him every single week, even though against cake matchups. Because what he show, what he shows is like what it is, right? Like he's in a he's put in an impossible situation. He has a horrible O line, horrible play calling from Matt Nagy. He's just like he's not set up for success. So even though the matchups are good, their offense still freaking stinks, right? And their defense, their defense is the only thing that keeps in the game. So he's not someone that's gonna like really light it up for you. So if people are trying to buy high, buy low on Dave Montgomery because of like strength of schedule, I would I would probably just fade that noise altogether. Um, not someone that I'm going after, but someone that that I think is good, hopefully, um, is J.K. Dobbins. He's got a good schedule. Uh, Nick Chubb, just coming back. Kareem Hunt, they have a really good schedule for rushing schedule. And then Tennessee Titans, obviously, Derrick Henry's got a pretty decent schedule as well. Um, so I think those are probably like the top running backs you want to look for. I think a sneaky like, throw into a deal, he's not somebody you're going to go out and inquire by himself, is Philip Lindsay. I know he's been banged up a little bit, but Melvin Gordon just hasn't been good this year at all. Uh, Philip Lindsay's getting more carries than him despite being hurt. He's shown his breakaway speed. And weeks 13 to 16 against Kansas City, Carolina, Buffalo, and the Chargers. Those are all really good matchups if and when he overtakes Melvin Gordon. All it's going to take from him is like 12 to 14 carries a game. And he can probably put up like back-end RB2 numbers. And I know that's not a lot, but like as a throw-in to a deal where like the owner isn't going to feel too bad about putting him in there, I don't think he's a bad play, especially like with COVID happening and a bunch of injuries. In the playoffs, you need depth and you need guys who can break big plays like that in your flex spot. And I think he's, he's a decent play there. Yeah, yeah, he's definitely one. So I think that I, I like those picks as well. And then obviously, like we said, pick up those handcuffs um, because they, they actually really, really offer you the upside that, that you want to see on the end of your bench. I think in terms of like passing, though, right, if you take a look at um, team efficiencies there, you, you got, you know, you got Aaron Rodgers. Green Bay has got a pretty friendly defensive schedule going forward. Kansas City Chiefs and the Chargers. So those are like Keenan Allen, right? Stud. You should be acquiring him in both redraft and dynasty. I just got him in a redraft league. I'm be looking to acquire him in dynasty. If you're a contender, you should definitely be picking him up. And then, you know, we got Devontae Adams. He's going to be impossible to buy. So not much you can do there. But Tyree Kill, I think, is actually undervalued. There hasn't been much talk about Tyree Kill. He's already got double digit touchdowns and, and like he's putting up a freaking monster, monster season. Um, but Tyree Kill, Travis Kelsey, Keenan Allen, these are all like top guys. They want to try and get and Houston. Houston's actually got a pretty good 
uh, pretty good defensive efficiency going forward with the exception of the playoffs though. So that, that's kind of the bad part about trying to invest someone like Will Fuller or Brandon Cooks. The, the playoff schedule is, is not that ideal, um, but they do have Deshaun Watson. So, and then the other component I think you like, I like to look at is like the opponent's offensive efficiency, right? Cause like getting scoring is two, two parts, like facing an easy defense is great and all, but like, if you just stomp them, like that's mm-hmm. not the recipe for that's success. like the issue with like the Dallas Cowboys other than this past week, like their defense stinks, but so does their offense. And sometimes yeah. you don't have to throw because of that. Yeah, exactly. But you want to look at teams that have good offenses that are facing good offenses. So again, that comes back to Deshaun Watson, um, Deshaun Watson, the bills as well. And as well as Russell Wilson, uh, so those are, those are the key guys you want to get there. Baltimore Ravens actually have a pretty decent schedule, but they don't freaking pass the ball ever. So that's kind of like a tough sell, but I think the sneaky one is probably the D- DJ, not DJ Moore, sorry. Uh, like, uh, spaghetti Anderson. Mm-hmm. And, uh, like you said, Curtis Samuel, cause I think they're, they got some pretty tough opponents coming up and you saw that Teddy Bridgewater definitely has the ability to let it up. So I think those are some interesting teams to target. I also the think line. the Bengals too. I know you said like, don't target teams that are playing bad offenses, uh, but you look at what they play week 12 through week 16. The Giants, I mean, are they going to put James Bradbury on T. Higgins or Tyler Boyd? Who knows? I just know that they're probably going to throw 50 times because that's what they do in Cincinnati. Then he gets Miami, which is a pretty tough defense, but Tyler Boyd in the slot isn't going to get Byron Jones or Xavier Howard. Uh, Dallas thereafter. Pittsburgh is like a good defense, but they give up a shit ton of points to wide receivers. And then week 16, they play Houston. So it's a pretty solid slate for a guy like Tyler Boyd. T. Higgins, you might be a little bit wary with that Miami matchup, maybe Pittsburgh on the outside, but uh, he's just been seeing so many targets. He's been super dominant that he's somebody that's probably valued as a wide receiver three that can probably be a wide receiver two for you going forward. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, So that's all we got for you guys on the playoff schedule. I will say, like, schedules matter for sure but like when you have elite players like you don't get too fucking cute with it right like i said dalvin cook is a tough schedule but you're just locking them in there every single week no matter what um deshaun watson like same story like he's just a stud because you never know like garbage time deshaun watson can put up four tds for you in a blink of an eye so like you just got to play you got to still play your studs and matchups really come into play for stuff like like those friend chats like david montgomery like i said like don't don't the, the, the opposite end of benching dalvin cook is locking in fucking david and i can see it right now i can see right now some of you fucking clowns out there getting ready to sit Dalvin Cook against the tough Bucks defense to start David Montgomery. I'm telling you right now, don't fucking do it because it's going to be a mistake. You're going to regret it. It's going to be painful. And I tweeted this earlier. I'd, I'd rather start a stud and have him put up like six points in my starting lineup than fucking bench him and watch him put up 30 in my, on my bench. Like there's no greater pain than that uh, other than being a Chargers fan. Ask Noah for that, for those Man, that's so fucking tough. I can't believe <laughs> that shit to me. But it makes sense. Like, you can rationalize away being like, well, I start Dalvin Cook because he's Dalvin Cook. Even though he plays Chicago, he's Dalvin Cook. I'm not going to start David Montgomery against Dallas or whatever bullshit defense he's going up against. At the end of the day, all you have to do is, like, be able to, in the future, if nothing goes right for you, be like, well, I don't feel bad about it because it made sense. Starting David Montgomery over Dalvin Cook in any situation never makes sense. So just be, be smart about it. Just have some common sense and you'll be fine. Yeah, exactly. All right, that's all we got for you guys this week. Hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, hit that freaking subscribe button, smash the like button, follow me, follow Noah, follow Nick. Uh, we got lots of videos. Hopefully, if you're tuning in this, you already saw Market Watch Mondays. If you didn't, go back and tune in that. Talk a lot about 2021 rookies in there. I don't, have you started talking about? Have you started looking at 21 rookies yet, or, or no? Not yet. Uh, I just know the big name guys, and I also know that guy Diami Brown because you love him. Yeah, hell yeah, baby, Diami Brown, stand account. We're here for him. Um, but yeah, I'll be, I'll be covering a lot more 2021 rookies uh, and, and even some Debbie prospects over on Market Watch Mondays uh, as the season goes along. Because I'm, I'm honestly, I'm over 2020 already. I'm, I'm ready. For I'm on to 2022. Stuff. Bill Belichick yeah. stuff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're on to 2022. Hope you guys enjoyed, man. We'll be back to you again with more videos. Make sure you tune in to Noah. Uh, are you still, you're still doing the Discord thing where you like talk to people, yes, right? Yes, sir. Every yeah. other Friday or Saturday, whenever I get it uploaded. Yeah, so that's been super dope, uh, you know, getting that engagement. I'm going to do something similar in terms of, like, roster critiquing, not so much trades. I'll probably do, like, a, I'll do, like, consultant. Uh, I don't know what, I don't know what it's going to be called yet. I'm going to think of a clever name like we always do for all of our segments on bunk beds. Uh, but I'll do, like, a consultation for a couple of rosters and do it live. And you can – we'll bring you online. You can show us show us your shitty rosters and how, how shitty you are, and I'll help you turn it around um, because that's what we do, man. We get you those Ws, add those Ws in the column. That's – what we do and we keep the content rolling we are just grinding out here on bunk bed breakdowns we're just grinding with video content all the time every day no breaks uh no you can tell man no is no is freaking smoking a fat blunt in his room he's like, <laughs> trying to chill out i'm just trying to chill out <laughs> I'm just trying people to think out. that i'm like a fucking stoner because <laughs> like, it's crazy <laughs> yeah um all right that's all we got for you guys peace, peace.